Okay, so these are just a kind of random selection of things that I uh, add to my file uh, when I come across things, when I see things. Uh, sometimes students have shared them with me, so you'll see that when it's a student share, I put their name generally. So if you find any interesting ones, please add them to the uh, uh, forum that I've created on the Moodle site for the course. That's right at the top, just near the announcement section there. So I, I have... Uh, gone into the settings and it is possible to put your own files up there. So if you screenshot something or if you are out for a walk and you see something ridiculous communication wise, feel free to post it there. Um, needless to say, of course, it is the, the poster directly linked to your student ID. So don't put anything rude up. That's pretty obvious. So, okay. Just use a bit of common sense. Okay. So um, sometimes you end up with really bad branding images just simply because you've put your um, brand on the product and then the product's been involved in some kind of disaster or catastrophe and this is this is one of those really sad things that happens to companies and it's particularly a problem when fundamental issues of trust reliability assurance giving customers peace of mind are at work there so um of course, all the airlines brand themselves on their tail, on the, the fuselage, the body of the plane. But when something goes wrong, it looks pretty bad. Okay, so that's the, uh, the Tokyo Tower example. Isn't good to drink. Okay, smoking on to racks. Okay, uh, I have this kind of bizarre image here that... Um, there is like some dude who was just standing on the tracks, just smoking a cigarette, having a durry, as you would say in Australia, and the train pulled up and they're just waiting for him to finish. Uh, so uh, that's obviously not the case. Uh, there was smoke on the tracks in some other way, but even then I'm still wondering how that actually happens without a train being on fire, even in Japanese, it's a little bit weird. Okay, okay, so this was the one I mentioned here, uh, where this just appears on the Metro, that uh, clearly they ended up with the two bits of text and um, as a consequence, both of them ended up on the train. And you know, when you think how expensive and how precise the, uh, the equipment is here to get something so elementarily wrong like this is really quite astonishing. It is an organizational cultural problem. Okay, Shinkansen Kaisatsu. Um, this is one of my very favorites and from very nice former Zemise who now works in Singapore, um, but she's from Hiroshima. Uh, it's cute, no poiste. Okay, of course, that is just not going to communicate to foreigners. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe just think of it as English as ornamentation. Uh, but with my young son, this is an ongoing kind of gag. I, uh, as a nine year old, uh, he thinks this is absolutely hilarious that um, if uh, English just involved writing Japanese in Romaji, it would be so easy. Okay, uh, Toku Hans, I just don't know where this came from. Uh, shirking is avoiding work. Uh, so mushiyoke becomes somehow shirking goods. I, I don't know. Okay, uh, this one you can see. In fact, uh, Bikuro has just opened up. I was in Bikuro on Sunday um, in the desperate hunt for a 1700 yen specialist mic cable which was absolutely vital to collecting, to connecting a 25,000 yen wireless mic to a camera, but which was sold out over the entire country um, online because it can be used also to patch a mic to a computer or an iPhone. So as soon as they opened up, I dashed into Bikuru on the assumption that their um, online shop wasn't connected to their physical shops and that they might have one. And I got the very last one. So anyway, I know where it is, um, but of course, uh, Konosaki Sugu is not soon to come, okay? Which is kind of cute, but um, seriously wrong. Okay, uh, this was from a former Zemise, uh, Shota-san, uh, who's particularly into kind of Cuban music. So he immediately recognized this, um, the Cuban sandwich yeah, sounds very good, except that the flag they have was from Puerto Rico, not from Cuba. Okay, of course, if you just want to have giggle about English, I think we all know this, you just simply go into the Hyakuin store and it's just absolutely full of it. Um, one of the things here, of course, that shows that so often 
English is not really English, that it's actually just ornamentation. Um, so what do we got here? This is Romaji in a nice late 19th century um, font. Um, Totomotsukai yasuku keizai teki na kawaii kada um, o hea ni mo ao yo. But it ain't gai kokogo. Okay, um, we got a whole bunch of them here. Um, it's a deodorant liquid only of pudding. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Um, first and foremost, we produce for human beings. Well, isn't that nice? Because uh, human beings are the only people who have, or the only animals on the planet who have money to pay for things. So if you don't make them for human beings, they don't sell very well. Uh, by the way, if you're curious in terms of that line of reasoning, uh, one of the first very, oops, one of the first very famous um, netta gags by the New York comedian Seinfeld uh, is all about dogs and why they don't go shopping. So if you Google that, uh, you'll find it. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of give away the punchline, but he works from the assumption that because dogs don't have pockets, they therefore can't carry money Therefore, the dog economy is underdeveloped. Maybe that's a logic. Anyway, first and foremost, we produce for human beings. And I'm thanks to the, the chap who spoke before. Otherwise, I'd have doubts that there are any human beings out there. All I'm seeing is just a bunch of profile pictures. And it is a very weird thing talking to my friend, the green dot. Okay. If anyone has seen the Tom Hanks film uh, where he's shipwrecked on a desert island and uh, his only friend is a basketball called Winston um, that has a face like blood stain on it. You'll know how bizarre this world is where you just get to talk to a green dot. Okay, um, this is one of my favorites because it's just so shit. Um, and it also directly affected me as a customer. I had accounts with uh, City Cards uh, and Citibank. Citibank uh, was trying to be a premium banking service in Japan, but they, Citibank had global problems and they decided to, decided to completely sell off their, their Japan domestic banking operations, their customer banking. They've still got some other um, financing functions and whatnot, corporate oriented stuff. But anyway, they sold it off to Sumitomo Mitsui or Mitsui Sumitomo, by the way, we're gonna come back to this as another example of classic ch chuta hampa. Uh, they, when Mitsui and Sumitomo emer merged, both of them were very proud. They couldn't agree who should be first. So they agreed in Japanese that it would be Mitsui Sumitomo, but in English, it would be Sumitomo Mitsui. So if you're talking with friends and you can't seem to agree on the name of the bank, it's because the bank itself can't seem to agree on the name of the bank. Anyway, what did they do? Uh, Sumitomo, Sumitomo Mitsui, uh, TB stands not for tuberculosis, but Trust Bank, uh, decided strategically to acquire city cards and city banking operations. And they're now under the Prestia brand and uh, Sumi Club. And they decided to announce it from the storeroom. So they got the media in, and as you can see from this image here, uh, they just held the press conference there. Now, remember, this was um, one of the few banking outfits that tried to offer a premium experience in terms of the spatiality of it. And we will talk about this. This is an interesting thing. You know, generally you go into most Japanese bank branches and you feel like you're in Albania in about 1987. They're pretty grim. The color of the walls seem to be designed to look dirty. So they hide the dirt so that they never have to wipe the walls again, but pretty depressing. Recently, the banks are trying to change because they realize that um, no one under the age of about 60 likes to visit a bank branch. I only go there twice a year and that's to pay my son's university fees. And it's only because uh, the university is more expensive than the daily um, online banking transfer limit. So anyway, uh, Citibank had this nice space. If, you, if you've seen what they had and Prestia has taken it over, for example, in the Higashi Shinjuku branch, uh, then you'd know that it was all about communicating through design, through the space, through the Kukan, an interesting uh, experience. Anyway, 
So what do they do? They hold this in a storeroom. And like so many organizations, uh, very bureaucratic, they're afraid to throw anything out. So why don't we look in the back there? We've got some old fax machines, which are clearly not used anymore, but they don't dare throw them out. They've got some computers, which are like hilariously small and low resolution. Um, and that's what they're doing. Now, this, I think, it would be a wonderful example for Room Rater. And if you haven't checked this out, and if you are using Skype, check this out, Room Rater at Rate My Skype Room. He, the guy who runs it now rates Zoom rooms as well. And what he's done is he, and now increasingly gets shares as well, he screenshots uh, or just simply takes a photograph of his TV when people are doing virtual interviews, particularly in this COVID pandemic uh, time, lots of people doing this from home. So you get to see lots of rooms and he is really bitchy. He's really nasty. He's one here. Um, I picked this one here because it popped up yesterday just as I was putting this together, but also because like name dropping terribly, but um, I know Kevin Rudd, the former prime minister from way back before he was in politics actually by chance um, and uh, did some things for him and with him. And anyway, he, um, Kevin Rudd has very good taste. He, well, he is a multimillionaire thanks to his wife. His wife actually set up a very successful business. It's probably worth about 80 million or hundred million dollars or something like that. So the money actually came from his wife's business and um, he himself was in politics and made much less. But of course he uh, gets a nice take on it with Room Rater. Um, we go across looking to the right, uh, very strikingly Room Rater, the guy who does this, uh, he's very politically partisan. He really hates people on the US right. So even if they've got a nice room, he'll say room nine out of 10, shit politics, minus 10, therefore you get minus one. Anyway, he obviously doesn't like this person, senator, insider, trader, whatever. Um, we're duck deducting three points for color coding books, minus three out of 10. And actually, I'm going to talk about this later on when we talk about spatiality, because we're seeing this more and more where books are used as ornament and not intended to be read. In fact, there's a very interesting business out there now where books are sold by the meter, um, stacked together with their spines, and they're purely for ornamentation. And you can order books by the meter color coordinated. And there's a huge backlash by people who actually believe that you should read books. Uh, one of the, uh, the memes this guy's given rise to is really horrible rooms with no decor. And he, and he describes them as hostage videos. But the door is open here. So he says, hostage video with a glimpse of an escape route. Please don't F things up. Two out of 10 for the table. Rahm Emanuel, huge interesting character. Uh, in fact, I've got his book right next to me, a brand new book. Um, former mayor of Chicago, former chief of staff to um, uh, Barack Obama, the former president, and also the brother of Ari Emanuel, who is one of the most powerful New York, uh, what am I saying, sorry, um, Hollywood uh, producers. If anyone's seen the film Entourage and uh, you see the uh, Ari Gold, that's actually a thinly fictionalized version of Ari Emanuel, his brother. And uh, the entire Emanuel clan, maybe except his other brother, who's a very famous surgeon, are famous for F bombing constantly. So we see a takeaway lesson here and something I'm always nervous about doing, doing Skype and Zoom and whatnot. Nice room, but of course, he's got the camera down around um, his navel, uh, his belly button. So you're always kind of looking down at the camera, which is a problem. Okay, so let's move on. Um, this is one of his other memes. Declutter is not a city in India. Uh, this guy really needs to get con muddied. He really needs Condor Maria to come in here and encourage him to so throw some stuff out um, or at very least maybe do what I'm doing wear a pure white shirt if you've got a backdrop like that anyway um, sometimes you can go to great efforts with design but the net effect is that uh, people read it in a slightly different way from how others do uh, this is actually in a very premium hotel in Israel you can see it's Hebrew okay business center um, 
but it kind of looks like people are going downstairs to do their business, okay, in other potentially problematic ways. Okay, um, sometimes people doing uh, product imagery are just incredibly lazy. This is a can of tuna brand, tuna brand. Now, I think most people in Japan know about Ippon Zuri and how you have to be super tough to haul a very heavy tuna out of the sea. Um, someone's got a bit of clip art here of someone fly fishing, which is a, a fishing technique that you would use in a, in a river in Montana or Scotland or Alaska or wherever. And you would catch a 300 to 400 gram, gram um, trout. You are not going to haul in an enormous salmon that way. And of course, you can see that uh, there is absolutely no tension on that line as well. So it's just silly, okay? Pole and line caught. But, and, and it's such a missed opportunity because, uh, as anyone knows, if you, and you go online and just, just Google uh, or just, just go to YouTube and search videos on tuna fishing, it's a pretty impressive thing. And you could use that really powerful imagery uh, to work the uh, the brand narrative, but they've just been incredibly lazy, and I just can't believe that it got through so many um, decision makers in the company. So, a really elementary thing: don't use what you don't understand. Okay, uh, this is a, in a cafe in uh, Marui in Yurakcho, and they've gone for the retro, the found or object, objet trouvé. Uh, we'll see that this is a common thing in design these days, a kind of an industrial look and whatnot. Clearly, they, someone who was doing the interior design, they, they don't know much about English and the history of, uh, obviously, hospitals. These are large uh, hospital storage bins. Clearly, bread is bread. And they've looked at soil dressing and said, dressing, 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 kana. Is it like Caesar salad and dressing, kana? Okay. Soil dressing is used bandages. Okay. So this is someone who's got some pussy, festerous wound that's had bandages on them in the days when bandages, hotai, were taken off, boiled, and reused. God forbid. Uh, no wonder so many people died by going into hospital, okay? Go in with a cut and come out in a box, okay? Um, so that is the last thing you want to see if you know what it used to be used for when you tuck into your roast beef, for example. Hmm. Of course, this one's pretty self-explanatory and it's silliness and rudeness, and many of you will have noticed this. Um, it is always strange to see people walking around with shopping bags with titty written on them. Um, I, if you don't know what it means in English, Google it. I'm not going to say it. I, I am being recorded. Okay. This one, this is just out there. Okay. Uh, this went massively viral. Some of you may have actually seen this before. Um, what were they thinking? Now I want to turn to the issue of losing control of media. There is this danger where you get a clever idea with social media, but once you put it out there, it is no longer just yours. And this is a key thing in communications acts. In the past, when it was very one way, you put an advertisement in a newspaper, uh, you put an advertisement, you know, a commercial on television, you had full control over the message, and typically it wasn't something that was easily shareable. Sometimes newspaper advertisements, people used to do interesting things with them. I remember when I was 15 years old, um, I did some work experience and then a part-time job in a newspaper printing plant. And one of the things is that the, uh, the printers used to like to do was that they would make cartoon versions of the news and photos and whatnot. Oops. Uh, okay, that's still good. Okay. So they would uh, get the daily newspaper, they would stick it up on the, uh, the, the notice board, and people would write funny comments on it, or they would, uh, you know, doodle on it, just like many people have done in their school textbooks. Of course, in social media, it's just simply so easy to take a hashtag or to take an image and to play with it, to parry at it. So once you put it out there, 
it's no longer yours. And you have to anticipate this as a basic design parameter. Okay, let's use the airline case. I'm gonna have a bit of a bash of Qantas today. Um, I'm in two minds about Australian Airlines. I've uh, just lost a plane ticket and lost money with Virgin Australia uh, going into administration. Unfortunately, I had shares in them. Um, so they've gone to zero. Uh, I may get something we'll see in relation to the plane ticket. Qantas, Qantas is all right, but Qantas once upon a time was the dominant airline in Australia and the big debate with the collapse of its rival, um, Virgin Australia, is will it go back to its bad old self? Anyway, like so many businesses, they tried to get into clever social media and they did this campaign, um, hashtag Qantas luxury. So, and so it was a simple competition. They said to enter, tell us what is your dream luxury in-flight experience? Be creative. Answer must include hashtag Qantas luxury, trying to make it go viral. And the incentive, ever wanted to experience Qantas first class luxury? You could win a first class gift pack featuring a luxury amenity kit um, and our famous QF PJs. Actually, the pajamas aren't very good. I, I was was given a pair of them when I uh, cracked an upgrade recent, uh, about a year ago. They're not, they're, they're overrated. Um, better to actually buy your pajamas from Uniqlo. Okay, so what happened? Okay, um, within a couple of hours of launching this, they had completely lost control. If you look down to the bottom, what I'm sharing here, social media expert James Griffin said that by 1 p.m. Australians were sending out 51 tweets a minute on the hashtag. Most of these were tweets making fun of the idea of Qantas luxury. So a whole range of things, um, for example, getting from A to B without the plane being grounded or an engine catching fire, Qantas luxury, okay? Um, Qantas luxury, when the passengers arrive before the couriers delivering the lockout notices do. This is a very famous industrial dispute where Qantas locked all of its employees out, stood them down and didn't pay them because they wouldn't accept a, a pay deal that it offered. So Qantas Luxury, anyone who had any frustrations with Qantas were able to mock this. And actually one of the things is the people who did this and with the greatest respect to you guys, cause you're young, didn't know a little bit of cultural history. There's a very famous English comedy skit uh, from back in the 1970s about called the, uh, the Yorkshiremen. With these Yorkshiremen in a competition competing to outdo each other with exaggeration. And uh, every time someone said about how terrible their childhood was, you know, when I was young, I had nothing to eat for two weeks and I had to walk 20 miles to school. The, uh, the other Yorkshiremen said, oh, luxury and went on to tell an ever bigger exaggeration about uh, the terrible suffering they had. So this was completely hijacked by people of an older generation who knew this, who kind of outdid each other with funny takes on luxury. Okay, um, this is a campaign that destroyed an emerging, this, no, this is good. What follows is a campaign that destroyed an emerging uh, boutique branding consultancy. Woolworths is one of the largest supermarket chains in Australia. Uh, you can see in the middle uh, there, the green on the red, uh, the fresh food people. This is a logo that's been around for decades and they've updated it and you can see that they've, they've cha changed the, uh, the look with the font there, um, emphasizing freshness against their major rival Coles. And indeed, they took the W of Woolworths and they made it look like a, I don't know, a green shaving of an asparagus or something like that as well. So they, uh, they really pitched that their competitive advantage is the freshness of their food. And it was quite a successful campaign. Now, probably most of you don't know this, but um, in Australia, like in Britain, for example, and in a different way in the United States, there's a very strong emphasis on uh, honoring war veterans. And we have this uh, in Australia, it's called Anzac Day, April the 25th. And Anzac comes from Australian New Zealand Army Corps, Australian New Zealand soldiers fought in World War I and a famous battle against uh, Turkey, which started April the 25th. And it's very much a national ideology and uh, it's problematic in some ways. But 
after World War I, and there's so many Australians died in the battles of World War I, fighting for the British side and the French side, of course, uh, war memorials were put all up, put up in every town and every suburb in Australia. And wherever you go, you will see statues of um, a soldier standing to attention with uh, this motto, lest we forget. So that's a very striking thing. Now, this is in 2015. This was the 100th anniversary of the battle which gave rise to Anzac Day, which was in Gallipoli in Turkey. So Woolworths stupidly decided to piggyback off this and um, very insensitively embrace the discourse of Anzac Memorial and tried to link it to the fresh food people with this catch line, fresh in our memory. So that in itself was kind of tasteless and was always going to get them in trouble. But then they did a particularly silly thing. They threw a um, site, allowed people to upload a picture so that this uh, text would overwrite the image of the picture. And the idea was to try and get people to post pictures of their ancestors in their uniforms who had served in uh, World War I. Of course, within about 30 minutes, this happened. Okay. Um, Adolf Hitler, fresh in our memories. And of course, the campaign was an utter disaster. Woolworths apologized. The firm was dismissed and lost their clients and uh, eventually was broken up. Okay, uh, it happens to the government as well. Uh, one of the, I would say, personally, it's my own view, less pleasant developments in Australia over the last 10 to 15 years has been the politicizing of border control and Australia has created its own Department of Homeland Security like the United States and they've created Australian Border Force. Well, they decided to hold a press conference, the, the particular minister, and roll out their new corporate image. And they invited the press in. And of course, people started streaming before the launch even happened. Uh, some people tapped into the stream and very quickly, Border Force was Star Wars eyes. And we can see there, we've got a stormtrooper overlaid over what was a horrible bit of imagery in the first place. Okay, uh, an Israeli example now, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi is his nickname, who's just headed up uh, his fifth government uh, as of yesterday, but a coalition government and uh, under the deal in 18 months time, he will step down and hand over to the former um, head of the defense forces, Benny Gantz as next prime minister. Anyway, Israel was very critical of the Iran uh, nuclear deal. And Netanyahu went when he was speaking in the UN he took this stylized picture of a bomb and he said, this is a bomb. And he had about the, the, the you can see the final stage, second and first stage was about the uh, Iranian nuclear en uh, enrichment program. Of course, Israelis themselves thought this was all rather embarrassing and very quickly through social media started parroting it, complaining, for example, that packets of chips are only two thirds full or you order a glass of wine and it's only two thirds full um, or all, or as it says here, you know, we cannot let Iran acquire Christmas tree ornaments. So gravitas, this great Italian notion from the Latin weightiness, gravitas was lost and a meme was established. Now, this is just a simple example from when I got on a Qantas plane. Okay. Um, a panel was falling off near my feet. And obviously the service people knew that if you get on a plane and something's falling off, it doesn't look very look good. So they put integrity seals on it, which in turn were falling off um, and were worn out. So there was no integrity in the integrity seals. So if you know there's a problem, fix it. Don't just um, do atomawashi, just trying to put it off. Okay, so more generally, if you're gonna communicate as an, as an organization, you know, tell people who care in a way they will care. So a Qantas example, and this was sent out to everyone who was a Qantas frequent flyer member. I'm not going to read it because I'm, I'm conscious of our time other than just a little bit, the opening. And remember, I'm going to keep coming back to this a key message from the first class 
in any journalism course, and it was a key message when I did my undergraduate journalism major, is um, 25 words or less, who, what, when, where, why, um, and particularly why should you care is the critical thing. So straight to point, connect with the audience. Okay, so dear Christopher, thank you very much. You know my name, very nice. You've been looking directly at me. Today, Qantas announced its full year financial results, an update of the Accelerated Transformation Program announced last February and the outcomes of the Structural Review announced last December. Yeah, so what? I have received many questions in the lead up to today and wanted to reach out to you. Um, do not use this expression, reach out to you. It's very kind of me too, pervy, it's a bit kind of creepy, do not reach out to anyone, um, with an update as a valued customer. If I'm a valued customer, why are you talking to me in internal bureaucratic jargon? I do not care about your structural review. What does this mean for me? And blah, 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 it goes on and on and on, okay? Um, if you're talking to the analysts, who are making judgments about Qantas's economic prospects and will be recommending to investment funds whether they buy shares or sell shares in Qantas, maybe. But when you're talking to a customer who just wants to collect some points so that they can pick up a free ticket from time to time, and it's never free because they have the surcharges, but anyway, um, then they don't care. They just don't care. So. Be very careful about the fallacy of assumed knowledge and projecting your own concerns, your own internal, internal dynamics, your own discourse onto the customers. And Oyakusho-san, people in offices, bureaucrats tend to do this all the time. It's not comforting to be told that an organization won't do something for you because of Rule 23, subsection A, uh, blah, 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 blah. So what? Tell it to your mother. She might care. That's an old um, expression. Or to quote my daughter, who's now 25, but I remember when she came back from uh, kindergarten when she was four and I told her to do something, she looked at me, stared at me, and then said, Daddy, tell it to the hand, okay, and holding your hand up um, defiantly to me. Nothing's changed, really, okay? So that's going to be most people's kind of reaction. Okay, there are plenty of cases where you might be convinced, but other people might be horrified. Okay, now, um, looking at the class list, I see we've got a couple of Scandinavian names here. I'm not sure if we've got anyone who's Danish. Maybe if you're Swedish, you'll take great delight in me um, slagging off a Danish example here. Um, Marius the giraffe. I would suggest you Google it, but some of the things you'll come across could be a bit disconcerting. Uh, to cut a long story short, Marius was a giraffe. He was a live giraffe, a uh, loved giraffe in the Copenhagen Zoo. But uh, one of the problems in zoos is animals breed in zoos. And then you end up with an increasingly concentrated gene pool. So uh, the Copenhagen Zoo had a number of giraffes and they're all related to each other. And as you know, just like families, you know, you should, you know, marry your brother. Uh, it's pretty weird. So it's a similar kind of problem with, with zoos. Um, giraffes are also big and difficult to transport. Normally this problem of a shrinking gene pool with uh, zoos is managed by trading animals. And this is a bit problematic with giraffes because they're difficult to transport. Anyway, so they had Marius the giraffe and Marius was getting to breeding age and they decided that Marius had to go. And there were initial discussions about moving Marius to a, mu to a zoo elsewhere, but Denmark is very strict in terms of its rules about animal cruelty and properly treating animals. And so a compliance issue arose about whether you could safely transport a giraffe with a long neck um, on an aeroplane, for example, or a ship or these kind of things. So in one of those kind of perverse logics where they said it would be cruel to send Marius far away, 
therefore it's better to kill him. And so Marius was killed. Then the, uh, they decided to kill him, but then they decided to use this as a teaching moment. And they thought it would be a good opportunity for kids to learn about um, what a giraffe looks like inside and also how lions like to eat bits of giraffe. So effectively, they killed Marius and they invited people to come and watch Marius being chopped up and fed to the lions. That's why I suggest you be rather cautious about Googling this. Needless to say, there was a huge outcry, um, particularly when you see the beautiful patterned uh, hide of Marius being chopped up into Marius steaks for the lions. My own take on this is uh, a simple one, and it's a, it's a twofold thing. What makes sense in terms of an internal logic might nonetheless instinctively revolt people. And we have to take those sentiments very carefully because they're giving us some kind of ethical feedback. People are drawn to animals for interesting reasons. And yes, you can reason that, well, in real life, beautiful giraffes are torn apart by lions routinely. And this is just simply educating kids on the realities of uh, the world at large. But yeah, okay, uh, the imagery is a problem. And then the bigger take on it for me is if you're going to kill it, don't name it. The act of naming is to do what we call to anthropomorphize something, actually to give it human-like characteristics. You create an emotional attachment with an animal because you named it. If you're going to kill it publicly, you cannot name it, okay? Um, otherwise, you end up with a huge outcry about killing Marius. Okay, uh, another thing about audiences and misreading audiences, very often it's just outdated assumptions. These are several I snapped to myself in Tokyo. Um, I'm very sensitive to this, having had uh, children and at times being the kind of primary caregiver, especially for my uh, most recent um, young son with his mum working full time since pretty much around the time he was born. I don't know how many times I've been with baby under arm looking around and seeing mother's room or the change room only in the direction of the women's bathrooms. Can men go in? Okay, so outdated assumptions about audiences are deeply problematic, not just problematic because of uh, Ikumen, uh, not that I was, okay, of uh, stylish um, you know, child raising dads, but also because of the terrible messages it sends to women about what is with the role of women's work. Uh, relative to being a mother, for example, and who should be looking after a child. Okay, now I've got a few rude ones here. Look away if you're troubled by this. Okay, um, warning, rude alert, alert, alert. Okay, um, this is not so rude. Uh, this was briefly very popular brand. Sorry, it's a bit shaky. I uh, photographed this in low light with my phone. Um, Blonde is a, it's a, it's a wheat beer. Um, and interesting thing in the beer industry is Generally, lots of men like to drink sweeter beers, but they will never admit it. Um, if you ask people in surveys, what do you like? They say, I like a dry beer. And particularly in a Japanese case, people say, yeah, dry guy. Okay. But if you do blind taste tests, generally um, men themselves, the vast majority of men actually pick a sweeter beer as the preferred beer. So this running with the, uh, the blonde notion, trash blonde, you know you shouldn't, but you can't resist it. This one, yeah, I'm not even going to say it. Uh, huge seller for a while in the UK, uh, particularly energy drinks sold to young men going clubbing and to sell these in bars and in off licenses, takeouts uh, that were open until late at night. Um, it was going to be successful. Okay, this one is actually from the Shinkansen, uh, heading over the joints of Shinkansen. So this is very much me kind of men would like this so um, buy this sake and um, she got drunk and then like snow she melted okay this one is a very recent one I'm not even going to get into this okay uh, you can look at it yourselves uh, very recent product maybe the the whole working at home kind of thing but the graphics the the oops the keyboard 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe this was a prank by a staff member in the supermarket. Um, yeah. Ideal for Valentine's. And then, of course, these are really, really, really rude ones. Excuse me. I suspect the one um, with the cup, the cup noodles, or the uh, the instant noodles, maybe a really un, uh, disgruntled employee when they were asked what would be appropriate English, came up with something seriously rude. Um, the other one for a special aunt, aunt. It's not what it looks like. It does go to show that um, you, if you write the text and then start playing with font it can get you in trouble. This one is just bizarre. I photographed this um, in the window of a pro-fascist wine shop in um, Rome. And then the guy standing next to me looked African. And then he was looking at it and he went, looked African. Very handsome dude, by the way. And he said, Yabe, call him Maji Yabe, or call him Mite, 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 Mite. I looked at him. Uh, no, you really are speaking Japanese. I'm not imagining this. And I, saw, and I said to him, Masuka, no, 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 And he said, Oh my God, no, 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 no. And it turned out, of course, we both lived in Tokyo and we both happened to be traveling um, in Rome. And we were both just astounded that actually you could sell fascist themed wine. Um, in this day and age. Okay, so there's some of the bizarre negative examples. Okay, um, I want to go over and show you some positive examples. Okay, now has everybody got this here? Um, if there's any issue, could you just simply message me to tell me straight away that it's not working? Okay, so these are some just some found examples. They're 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 completely kind of random. Okay. Ah, oh, stuck again. Okay, thank you, Dan. Okay, let's try this again. Stuck again. Da, 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 da. Okay. I'll stop the share and restart the share. Stuck again. It's a metaphor for my life. How are we now? Hang on. Just a moment. Got so many windows open here. Okay, so you're seeing me now. If um, I don't have my chat with me I'm on display now because I've gone into full view. So if someone can tell me if you're not seeing it. Yeah, we're seeing the mines, the danger mines. Okay, good. Right, okay. So of course, if you're in the, uh, the public transport system in Tokyo, you'll see that uh, JR has really picked up on uh, communication design, visual communication design quite effectively. Um, of course, the color coding of the train lines is a very striking thing here. Uh, it's not just, of course, in, in Tokyo, but Tokyo is really using this quite effectively to steer people instinctively. If you look at this, you know exactly um, you're heading over to Yamanote-sen and Keihin-sen. And so- Professor, you, yeah. we're still stuck on Denger mines. Oh, okay. Danger mines. Okay. Let me go back again. Let me, I'll stop the share. 
stuck on danger mines. Thank you. with me just a second. <clears throat> I uh, wanted to do a full simulation on this, but I realized the problem was this time around to make it easy for you guys, I let you join the room before I did. And um, then as a consequence, I, uh, I couldn't do a dry run in advance because I would have had to actually end the meeting that a whole bunch of people had actually kind of opened on this screen. So next time around, I won't do that. I'll, uh, I'll have to just get you to, uh, to join. Um, once I open it up so that I can dry run it so each, although I can check it off a different device with a different, a different uh, profile, but it's not that you need to check it on the original machine you're going to use. Okay. Uh, let's see how we go now. Fingers crossed. This is going to work. Okay. Can you see all the slides? Yeah, we can see yes. All, you can see all the slides. Okay, so now we'll go into play and let's see if it cooperates. So you're seeing JR now? Uh, Sun Yongbang Home or something. Yep, fantastic. Yep, Sun Yongbang Home on Yukino Elevator. Good. Okay, thank you. Sorry, okay. I feel like, uh, like moving around the slides because it's slightly dark and usually when it's slightly dark, it's usually stuck. And it's stuck now too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's stuck now. So have you... Have you got danger mines in front of you? No, we still got the elevator. Damn. Okay. Uh, right. Can you can you see all the slide view? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. Um, I know this is really crappy, but how about I do it this way? Uh, just I, I don't want to waste time. Let's just run through some exit because this is this is not so important. So let's just do it this way. Okay. Um, are you seeing my entire screen? I imagine though. How about that? Is that better? Can everyone see okay? Yeah. yeah it's a okay, let's let's do it this way. It's there's just something about going into keynote and hitting play and um, I, I'm another bit of homework for me to resolve. I, I spent a fair bit of time playing with this to, to try and figure everything, but I still don't know why that is. Okay, um, so anyway, uh, back on Danger Mines. Uh, wherever you are in the world, if ever you see a red triangle with or without the yellow background, stop. Do not walk any further forward, okay? It is a standard international sign for mines. Now, this is actually on the Golan Heights um, up in uh, far northern Israel that Israel took off Syria in the uh, Six-Day War in 1967. Um, and uh, they still haven't cleared the mines up there, actually. Um, and this sign was first developed after World War I. And uh, that was, of course, to communicate to people clearing up battlefields where they had to be very careful and going. Uh, now, this is, this is a store in Italy. If you're selling uh, beautiful glassware, why not use the glassware itself and a bit of backlighting just as an opportunity to create a hugely impressive draw card for people when your store is closed? So they pay a little bit more on an electricity bill, but you walk past the store late at night and you can look in and it is a very seductive thing. So the product will help to sell itself. Um, this is an example in uh, Italy. Uh, in this case, the worst thing they could do would be to actually repaint the facade. This actually speaks to a little bit of heritage. Um, and we see that a whole lot of businesses go to great efforts to fake this, okay? So the store has probably been in a family ownership for a couple of decades. And then of course it's got product in the window. Mind you, I'll never ever buy a bottle of alcohol that's been sitting in the sun like that. Um, so that's kind of pure ornamentation. So this is a campaign that was actually being done, commissioned by the Italian fashion industry to try and discourage people from buying fake products. This is in Venice. And those of you who've traveled in Italy will know that um, a lot of people selling fake products are often um, illegal, uh, working illegally or trading illegally. Um, they lay out the products on a sheet very often with string tied to the corners. And if the police come, they can very quickly bundle it up and run away. So this was a way of speaking uh, to that. Um, but then also playing, of course, on the notion of a crime zone and, and all the rest of it. 
like a couple more Italian examples here. One thing I want to emphasize is that um, effective communication design does not have to be expensive or even very professionally done. And actually, sometimes this is better. And you can think of an example, if you go into uh, Don Quixote, uh, Don Quixote in English, the discount store, often it's not as cheap as people think, but it looks cheap. You go in there and they have boxes that have been hacked open with a cutter. They have handwritten signs. It looks like you've found a place that's going to be super cheap. So sometimes if it's too polished, you actually scare people off. Now here, they just simply want to communicate about this very particular type of um, local product. It's, it's like a pizza, but it's not a pizza. Um, very distinctive in Padova area. Uh, Padova is an, an ancient city, not very far from um, Venice, one of the oldest universities in the world. In fact, the oldest medical school. And indeed, they're very much at the forefront of um, dealing with the COVID um, pandemic in Northern Italy. And their area was very effective because they had the, in dealing with it, because they had the, the expertise there. So a lot of people go there for the university and whatnot, but it's always a kind of a poor cousin in terms of the tourist destination to Venice. Although I recommend if you can't afford the accommodation, Venice stay in Padua and actually just take the train because it's, it's only 30 minutes. So here they're just simply communicating that they're using the flour, farina, from nearby in Padova, um, and the mozzarella, um, and the tomatoes are uh, from a valley in the Po Delta, which uh, Padova um, is adjacent to. So ironically, the more kind of more handwritten it is, the more authentic it actually is. There's, the chain store would never do this, for example. Now I turn to a, uh, a very local example in the sense that Yayoi Kusama um, lives and works very close to Waseda, uh, but also kind of local for me in the sense that she did um, artwork for the Brisbane court building. I'm originally from Brisbane in Australia. And uh, she went to the site and they asked for an for um, art installation and she was struck by how the press were hanging around outside the court building, waiting for judgments or court developments to report. And so the sense that the press were watching the courts and then this, this broader question about who is actually watching the press in turn. So she got this idea um, very much within her own motive style, but an original idea to put eyes all around the courts. Now, several very conservative judges actually complained about this. They found it very intimidating to have all these eyes looking at them, which of course had them universally mocked as a result. Um, and by the way, Yayoi Kusama is absolutely adored in Australia, particularly for some of her participative kind of art projects like the red dot, red dot thing where people, huge numbers of people come through and make the artwork by actually putting dots in this, in this once pristine white space. So we'll talk more about that with co-creation. Now, of course, something very relevant here in Japan, but perhaps uh, now with the pandemic, perhaps one reason why the pandemic um, hasn't been so bad here is that there's long been an emphasis in Japan, of course, on um, good hygiene, good conduct in public places. Uh, but I, I just snapped this one because I thought this is an interesting communication technique. So, you know, wants people to wash your hands, okay, um, and to not make a mess of the, uh, the public bathroom. But it says, you know, itsumo kirei ni ano otsukai itadaki arigato zaimasu. So, thank you for always using it so nicely. Now, if that was true, they wouldn't need the sign. There's obviously people messing it up. But it's a lot easier to get people to cooperate if you thank them in advance for always being so responsible rather than saying, don't be a filthy grub, don't be irresponsible. So to lead with a positive, positive message, making it very, very difficult to act um, badly as a consequence. Okay, um, unfortunately Loft is um, kind of closed here, but anyway, um, I think this is just a wonderful little way of rather than just simply saying Loft is one meter um, one minute away to simply say koko kara skip de ippun. So it's a one minute skip away. Now I can't imagine many oyaji skipping down to loft, but maybe the target market in particular might be more inclined to do so. Um, sometimes you can do very, uh, very 
clever branding, which leverages some, someone else that has a powerful brand. And this is one I absolutely love. And I'm sorry about the lousy image, but I uh, literally snapped it on a, on a train platform, or in, indeed from a train, as you can see. Um, so riff on uh, Lady Gaga, Lady Kaga, um, just promoting the destination. Okay. Now, sometimes you get very blunt, but effective messaging. Some Italian cases. Um, one of the big issues in Italy is that many of the traditional high quality uh, pizza places are being displaced by generally crappy fast food places where they do a bit of pizza, they do kebab and whatnot. So no kebab has been a way of differentiating the proper pizza area, pizza area from the, uh, must say very often migrant run, um, not so high quality takeaway place. Of course, this is pretty blunt. Okay. No China. Okay. This is in Venice and Murano glass. Um, but ironically, Chinese tourists themselves are hugely sensitive about being sold fakes. They want to buy the authentic product. So it, it, it seems pretty blunt. Um, but it certainly speaks to the target market. Okay, so we'll kill that off. Um, and I'll jump straight into another bit of, bit of uh, content here. Uh, looking at our time. Okay. So hopefully you've all had a chance to engage with the, all the video material, uh, the particular examples of better practice that I've got on the, uh, the website. And uh, I'll come over and I'll briefly flag that. So this is our site. Okay. Um, I'll come back to some of the contents that here that um, I asked you to look at yourselves, particularly around brand narratives later on in the course. And particularly when we're talking about theory, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, um, uh, and particularly creative engagement and irony and authenticity and whatnot in relation to this. Um, some of the stuff that I had under topic two is very relevant to our discussion here, of course. Uh, the Omani commercial, uh, we see telling brand stories. I've talked about the Arbor case. Um, just here's a simple test more than anything else, you guinea pigs right now. Um, Battalion is a Norwegian snowboarding brand, pretty edgy. It's actually created by, by a combination of a snowboarder and a guy, I think had a PhD in physics and whatnot. So an inter, inter, interesting crowd and they do very, very distinctive things. But of course they want to show that they're radical, even though they're a business. So, oops. Did you just get bombarded by sound or did you guys get no sound then? Uh, there was no sound. There was no sound? Yeah, it's okay. You got sound or you didn't? No, 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 nothing. Nothing. Okay, right here, good, right. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, we'll just look at the images. So, uh, a whole bunch of sampled images, of course, showing riots and whatnot in the past, many of them 30, 40 years old. Um, actually doesn't happen so much these days in Europe, but kind of communicating that this is kind of edgy, contrarian and whatnot as a brand. And so we see this in often extreme sports and particularly say in the, uh, the subculture of snowboarding. So turning to the uh, not fails, I would explicitly say not fails, but um, it would be if you just simply copied this in this day and age, uh, the campaigns for obsession, Calvin Klein, were hugely influential at the time, widely copied. That's an early Kate Moss, for example. Um, and at a time when it was quite risque, for example, particularly in marketing directly to the gay community, uh, because for the very lively gay communities in the late 80s, but in terms of public media, mass media, there wasn't any acknowledgement whatsoever that that was true. So we see here this kind of playing with ostensibly a hetero message, but clearly targeting the gay market um, with Calvin Klein's campaigns there. So uh, I've got a bunch of other videos here. If you haven't looked at them, please do so. Uh, the links jet one, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, let's go over to the slides. 
I'll stop here and go up to the slide set. No, do I dare try showing the slides in full? I think I will, um, but I fear it's going to freeze. So let's see how we go. Okay. Um, yell out and tell me if it freezes. Okay. So these are talking points related to the examples on the course website. Um, uh, the early 90s, of course, there was very much a uh, film noir fad in terms of advertising. Did, did that advance? No. Uh, We're still not past. You're still stuck. Okay. Um, can you see it all now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's do it this way. Oh, uh, dear me. It should be so simple. By the way, I, uh, I spent at least about eight hours on the weekend trying to figure out the technical issues of using your iPhone as an external camera with a um, iMac or a MacBook on Zoom. It should be so easy, but it's remarkably difficult. And it's so much easier to do if you actually use Windows, surprisingly. So um, one of my takeaways is that um, Apple just never really took seriously the whole virtual work thing until COVID-19. And it's going to roll out all this new functionality, but it'll be too late. Anyway, um, so we, we see here Giorgio Armani bringing in David Lynch, who was the leading avant-garde uh, filmmaker from the, of the United States at the time. It must have been hugely expensive to do a commercial. Um, that doesn't really look like me, but I was repeatedly asked whether that was me in the past. Um, if you actually watched the commercial, because the reason being is that I, I was overseas just around the time when this kind of came out. And then um, years later, people say, did, did you get a, you know, a bit work, brief bit job basically appearing in advertisement? I say, absolutely not. Didn't look that good. Um, anyway, the, uh, the broader point about Calvin Klein's obsession and this particular style is that it was hugely influential and successful until it was brutally parodied by um, Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. So you may know both of these, these folks went on to be very famous um, actors and to do their own thing. Um, and they had a comedy series uh, in the early mid 1990s. And you can still see plenty of episodes online um, on, on YouTube. And so I've, I've got the link to the, um, the parody there. Unfortunately, every time it goes up on YouTube, it's taken down. So, but it lurks on a daily motion link and you can find that on the website. So once they did a parody of it, no one could make another um, commercial or a movie in a similar kind of vein. And of course, one of the takeaways here was that this took quite a while for parody to happen and it took some prominent, prominent comedians to do this on the BBC. In social media now, you can become the victim of a parody very, very quickly. By the way, I am going to announce a Pokachan parody competition for this semester too, because I'm, um, and I'll, I'll update about that, because I'm extremely aware that doing all of these pieces to camera, it's just so tempting to run an entirely separate track, taking the piss out of me and the piss out of your professors. And there's lots of precedents for this. Um, some of you will know the Hitler parody video genre. Um, unless you grew up in Australia, you wouldn't know about two famous comedians, Roy and HG, um, who every Olympics, and they used to do every Saturday on sports too, on the radio, would invite people to watch the Olympics and turn the volume down and instead listen to their own commentary, um, which was usually extremely rude. Um, so I've got a couple of examples that politer versions that were actually done on television and I'll put them on the website. So, so if you want to do the equivalent of a Hitler parody video and mercilessly mock me, um, I'm going to give a, I don't know what the prize is going to be. I don't know. I might, I might, I might give someone a goat or something. Okay. Uh, just to figure it out. Anyway, so um, parody is both your friend and your enemy. Parody, of course, is much more likely to go viral much more quickly. And for people to understand the parody, they're going to see the original media material. So you have to kind of parody proof what you do. 
you you have to make content that can be parodied in a way that doesn't make your original media look incredibly stupid. Now, I want to briefly speak to this incredibly successful campaign in Japan, Soda Kyoto Eko, okay? And this is a meme, which well, it's not a meme, really. Well, it's, it's, it's proprietary. They own it. Uh, this is JR Tokai. Been doing it for a very long time. And it's been incredibly successful. And, and I'm curious, those of you who know this, and maybe unmute your mic and uh, speak up. Um, why do you think this bit of copy, Soda, Kyoto Iko, why does it work so well, do you think? Anyone want to have a go? Mm. I can hear some people thinking out there. Who's been to Kyoto? Well, obviously you can't go. To, well, you can go, but uh, the uh, the governor of Kyoto said Konaide Konasai just kind of recently, and then uh, but he followed it up quite nicely by saying, "But you know, it pains me to say this, but uh, and I hope you hope in a couple of months you will come back." The, uh, the governor Chiba was just a lot more was a lot ruder about it, so a lot of people said, "I'm not going to Chiba ever again," which is can a lot of people live in Chiba. That's a bit a bit not practical. Um, my daughter's fiance lives in Chiba, <laughs> um, so. Why, why was this effective? Okay, well, I'll say it. Um, you know, the interesting thing with Kyoto is, and like so many other destinations in Japan, with the Shinkansen, it's actually incredibly easy to get to from, say, from Tokyo. So obviously not, probably not now, well, you could, but um, we're not in complete legal lockdown. But you can, Kigaruni, on impulse, without any planning, just wander down to Tokyo Station, get on a train. They leave every seven or eight minutes during the middle of the day, kick back on the train, and in a bit over two hours, be pulling into Kyoto. Um, but we tend to get into our daily routines. We're busy. We're doing what we do, you know, crowded trains, university, home, job, all of those kind of things. We don't really think about on impulse going to Kyoto. Now, of course, from a student's perspective, going to Kyoto on the Shinkansen is expensive. But, you know, for those who are working, have got a decent income, it's not such a dramatic thing to do. Um, I don't own an apartment in Tokyo, but I do own an apartment, which I bought very, very cheaply um, in the middle of a ski field in Niigata, just in the middle of Iwapara ski job. And I kind of know this, ma, kigaruni, soraiko kind of thing. If having a bad day in the office, it's Friday, I've been in a tedious meeting, it's like, ah, oh, more, yeah. Okay, so I can just throw my laptop in my bag, I go straight down to Tokyo Station, um, jump on the train in an hour and 20 minutes, I'm there, 10 minute taxi ride, and I could be pulling on my snowboard boots and I could be on the lift because I got a season pass. I could be snowboarding, literally, you know, I can go door to door my office to be heading out into the ski field in two hours. So, yeah. Japan is incredibly convenient like this, but most of the time people don't do this, okay? So it's really about saying, you can go out and do this, it's there, and you can do it on impulse. And it is a kind of a reset. And if you look at the advertising materials there, the campaign's brilliant. They use a common soundtrack, um, but in lots of different musical forms. So the melody is familiar, even if it's a jazz version or it's a classical version or whatever. So it has long running currency. And so beautiful images and with the full seasonality there. And of course you can feature so many attractions and you can keep refreshing the copy. And this is a really important thing and we'll talk a lot about this. Keep using what works. Uh, one of the uh, most common mistakes made in advertising is to think that you've got to do something completely new. You've got to refresh the message, but if the message is good, keep using the message. Don't jump around, be, be consistent. And the message becomes ever more valuable as a result. And also with social media, social media um, means that things are, uh, have to be very, very contemporary, very fresh, but at the same time, what was done in the past stays around. You can see all of these Soda Kyoto Iko commercials before YouTube. You couldn't see them at all. They were broadcast on television and that was it. Now, don't mess with what's work, what works. And that's why I hate this. 
because when the Japanese government started throwing lots of money around for a cool Japan campaign, and I've given some presentations to Gaimisho and whatnot on this, um, they do this. Soda, Kyoto Eko, cool Japan, Iran. It's inherently cool. And the worst thing you can do from a branding point of view is call yourself cool. Um, cool is for other people to decide. This is the inherent flaw in the cool Japan campaign. Uh, no. Anyone who tries to act cool is not cool. Okay, it has to look effortless. Kako, the worst thing you can do in Japan is kakotsuke, right? Kakotsuke, kakotsuke de so calling yourself cool is inherently uncool. This is inherently, well, it's, I don't even know, I wouldn't even use the word cool, but it's, but it's cool. Let's say it's cool um, without writing cool on it. Um, small firms with an interesting history can use a range of social media and do, do a whole range of things to engage new generations of customers. And this is a fascinating case, Seikado in Kyoto. If you get to Kyoto, you're from Kyoto, engage with them. The, I think his um, fifth generation, lovely chap, speaks very good English. I bought some nice product. Whenever you get to come in over into my office, eventually you can see some of their product. Um, very impressive what they do, collaborating with foreign designers and very open to that. And they, in a good, in a meaningful way, have a brand statement, um, an ethos. And I'll talk a lot more about this because uh, a lot of companies do this, but do it quite poorly. I'll read this one out. Um, I'll read it in English. In this day and age, the world is overflowing with things. Being surrounded by so much, we start to forget the importance and the value of the truly special objects that indiscriminately want to eliminate everything. So it's kind of like Eddie Con Muddy, don't throw everything away, don't go for extreme minimalism. But in the background of these special things, there is hidden culture, tradition, art, technology, as well as the hearts of many people who have been involved. Not only do we take care to create products of high quality, we value those hidden aspects and do our best to convey them. I think that's a pretty sophisticated statement and it's in very nice English. And of course it mirrors the Japanese. So clearly have collaborated with some, some wise people. Now, just uh, a couple of brief comments about campaigns online that you can see online there. Um, the uh, campaign there by Toyota for the Hilux, um, Brilliant campaign, incredibly successful, very risky. Toyota is very cautious in Japan, but has been very bold in Australia to the point where, you know, this nothing soft gets in. Okay. And it played on um, a whole range of things. The city, country, cultural divide in the Australian case, the iconic vehicle, the Hilux is the default vehicle for farmers or the mining industry. You go to work on a large mining site, there are 50 Hiluxes kind of lined up. That's the only thing that is bought. Okay. But politically in Australia, like other places, border security issues and whatnot have become more of an issue. And we have these, these ridiculous uh, reality TV with TV cameras filming in the airport. And the next slide is an image for that I took myself actually. Um, so you can suddenly find yourself being on reality TV. They like nothing more than to harass some poor old Chinese lady who's, you know, brought pork buns for her son studying in Australia um, and then fine her for breach of quarantine, for example. So these television commercials parody uh, this, but by, by turning it domestically, okay? It's got a whole bunch of kind of associations. Um, at the same time, what it does is, as I say, at the bottom here, it leaves space for ironic urbanite adoption of the product. So what we've seen, for example, in the gay community in Sydney, they've embraced some of the traditional images of working class Australian men. So there's a, there's a very famous blue singlet, tank top, um, which typically was worn by, uh, by, by shearers and construction workers. And so that's become an iconic thing in the gay community, for example. So you get gay men driving rugged Hiluxes, okay, um, as uh, a kind of a playful, ironic engagement with the product. So the country buys it because they think that finally a, a, a company is talking to their dislike of yuppie cosmopolitan urban professionals. And 
um, urban professionals love it because they think Toyota is taking the piss out of people in the country who are not like them. By the way, this is the more scary thing that I mentioned. Okay, so finally, my, my angle here is know your segment, okay? Um, classic example of this is this incredibly successful campaign, and you can see all about it on the, uh, the website, Linksjet. Um, it is shocking, I think, for young women to see that this was so successful. Um, simply put, sex sells, okay? Unilever has done this incredibly well in a lot of markets. Linksjet was remarkably successful. A um, bunch of younger guys out there, I know. I don't want to over, over, over stereotype, but simply put, uh, lots of young men are worried about smelling disgusting and they want a bit of roll on nice scent, which will simultaneously hide their kind of gross man smell while at the same time, um, making the chicks dig them. Okay. So kind of ridiculous. Um, but if you get this formula, right, it is a hugely profitable, um, segment. And we've seen, um, that this worked and the more feminists and others criticized the depiction of women as objects of loss, it got huge buzz. And this was an era before widespread use of social media we say way back in 2005. So it really did work as a campaign. And I know that's kind of depressing. Okay. So I'll close that there. Now, I just want to throw up a couple of slides to feed our uh, conversation next week, okay? Um, and let me go to an, uh, my final screen share. Hang on. So, da, 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 because I'm really conscious of our time. Okay, I've just got a couple of minutes. So, hang on, let me, let me close this and reopen it so that it finds it. And this is to talk about Wasida. Okay, um, now you already know about the case because I've uh, mentioned it to you uh, last class, but a couple of years ago, during our Ipanushi period, we, uh, was it, it, I didn't do it myself, but uh, the uh, um, so PR section uh, did some very clever work in terms of changing the world with your words. So they put that out there and they had beautiful uh, photography, a very good photographer to do the work. And they featured a whole bunch of prominent graduates of Waseda, people like Ishikawa Naoki, photographer, Nishikawa Niwa, film director, um, Matsu Kiyoshi, you see, is a record producer, um, and very famous um, Sato Oki, um, a designer, okay? Um, now, Sato Oki was actually, he is a graduate of both the undergraduate master's program in architecture at Waseda. So he was trained as a, as a designer and his firm Nendo, a very influential design firm, they still do some architecture. Um, but the, the interesting thing is of all of these folks, um, arguably only Sato Oki is working in a field where he was directly educated at Waseda. So all of the others have kind of made their name in domains that actually Waseda doesn't teach. So you could argue maybe liberal arts or something was a kind of a relevant background, but it's not as if we actually trained people to be record producers, um, to be filmmakers uh, or whatnot. Okay. Um, now, by the way, N Nendo did a full rebranding of the Waseda rugby team. So if you're actually interested in Waseda's rugby and you see the note the change in the uniforms and a whole bunch of things, uh, they did this and you can actually go to the Nendo website and read about it. Now, of course, one other person who was there, uh, quite beautiful picture, very good photography and nice graphic design was Goro moro -san, very, very famous rugby player, very famous with his kick. Okay. Um, and his approach to kicking, almost like he was praying for the ball to go over. Um, almost like his hairstyle kind of mirror, mirror what he do with his hands actually. Um, but of course the striking thing was that these are impressive folks and Waseda very understandably uses them to leverage their brand, but actually words were not their primary tools. So the catch copy was actually fine and good, but the imagery didn't actually gel. Now probably most people don't care, but my own view is that psychologically you can end up with a bit of Iwakan, 
okay? Um, but the, there are conflicting kind of messages there. So what I want to do with the next class to, as a kikake, um, as an impetus to be a bit interactive with too much content today, and I'd like to start with just a simple breakout room, is to ask ourselves how Wasada has been doing um, in terms of the uh, COVID communications, okay? And I've just simply screenshotted a bunch of um, uh, the messages from the top of the Wasada, Wasada page there. Um, one of the things you notice straight away is that actually on the basic management of our website, we're actually pretty clumsy. In Japanese case, it's Aigakuse, Shinyuse, no Minasae, okay? Um, and then it jumps straight into Kyokushaku no Zaitaku Kenkyu. Like when you read it, uh, you expect it to say, terribly sorry, welcome to Wasada, but you can't meet your professors at least until the end of May. But it doesn't say that at all. Um, it leaps in in an incredibly messy kind of way and tells the professors that you can't come to work, okay? And the interface is kind of ugly. Of course, in the English side, they kind of knew that, but all they did was to all Wasada University um, students, faculty and staff. So afterwards they realized mm, that didn't kind of make much sense. Now I want to say from the beginning, um, I'm a bit of a fan of um, Professor Tanaka, our new president. Uh, quite explicitly, I voted for him in the presidential election and he's been a breath of fresh air. He comes to our Kyojuke, he insists on speaking in English and taking questions in English and he's, he's very internationally oriented. Um, of course, you know, there's a bunch of, I don't know if he wrote these messages from the president, uh, whether other people draft them, they've gone out in his name, he's been proactive there. Um, but we, we can have a full and frank discussion about how we, we think those, those messages have worked. Um, and we've got the English version there as well. So I have my, uh, my own thoughts, but um, I don't want to prejudice the conversation there. Um, so I'll just simply say, I know President Tanaka is really sincere. Um, and we uh, can have a conversation about um, how Wasada is doing from your perspective as students, as stakeholders. Now, I'm conscious we're right at time. So this has been a pretty full session. I'm trying to pack it all in um, into just uh, one comma. So next week, we'll kick off with a breakout session doing this uh, interactive conversation. And uh, I'll have some more content that I'll put up in advance and so it'll be the usual mixture of a period for live session and uh, a lot of material that you look at in advance, some on video on demand, third party and my own stuff um, in advance. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I'll hang around if anyone wants to message me or interact with me. Okay, thank you. <laughs>